Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alyssa Kuchuk. I'm the director of the Ukrainian Institute of London. It's a, an, a privilege and huge pleasure to uh, partner on yet another event with the European Parliament Liaison Office in the UK. Um, and it's my honor to introduce our moderator and the speaker um, of tonight's discussion. So, um, the evening will be moderated by James Meek, who's a novelist and a journalist. He grew up in Scotland and lived in Ukraine and in Russia in the 1990s, and as lives, now lives in London. Um, he has published numerous books, uh, um, books of short stories, collections of essays, six novels, um, so please, if you haven't read uh, work by James, do. And he's a contributing editor to the London Review of Books and has written on Ukraine quite a lot. Um, and our speaker tonight is Rory Finnan, who is University Associate <coughs> Professor of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Cambridge. He launched Cambridge Ukrainian Studies in 2008, and I can say that there are at least three or four graduates of yours in the room today, Rory. Every four, four, right? At least four like, that I know of, anyway. Um, he is former head of the Department of Salonic Studies and former chair of the Cambridge Committee for Russian and East European Studies as well. And Rory is a trustee of the Ukrainian Institute London and of course he's the author of this amazing book, Blood of Others, that we'll be discussing tonight. So, Okay, you have that one. I'll have this one. Uh, thanks very much, Alessia. Um, and I'm, I'm very honoured to be here. Uh, and thank you all for, for coming out. Um, I, I don't know whether there are any England football fans in the audience, but if anyone's thinking of leaving at 7 o'clock, then maybe you should leave now. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, I, I'm uh, really pleased to be talking to Rory about his wonderful book. Uh, it is really something. Um, it's, uh, it's an unusual book, it's, it's a complex book in, in a good way, um, it's a very rich book and really, literally, there is no page that does not contain some new voice that you, you think, I must read this, this person. And also, at least one, if not several, uh, ideas that make you want to sit down and think about them for a bit. So, um, I did read it rather slowly. Um, because there is, there is much to think about. Um, and uh, yes, I, I, I mean, I was going to start with something else, but uh, just, just to begin with, I, when I moved to Kiev in 1991, I uh, did not speak either Russian or Ukrainian. Um, and uh, and I, the language that I chose to learn in Kiev and, and they taught me pretty well, was sadly Russian. Um, I now regret that I didn't take more time to, to study Ukrainian, but um, I hope I'm not going to embarrass you here, but you certainly give the impression that your grasp of, of languages is, is very wide. Uh, Russian, Ukrainian, but you actually speak Turkish? Um, speaking Turkish. Uh, <laughs> I kind of speak Turkish like a doctor speaks Latin, I suppose. Um, so I, I, I work in Turkish, I read Turkish, but um, I lived in Turkey uh, for some time, but sadly my spoken Turkish is not as good as it could be. Well, it's, it's, it's fantastically uh, impressive. Um, you're clearly uh, conversant um, on, on all the important levels. And we'll come back to, to that um, a little bit later. But um, what happens when you write a book like this? You spend years on it, it's extremely complex, and then somebody comes along and an event like this and asks you this, this uh, naively, blindingly stupid question. Um, and the question here is, who are the Crimean Tatars? And can we say they are the native Crimeans? First of all, James, thanks so much. Uh, I want to just begin by thanking the Ukrainian Institute London, Olesya Khromaychuk, Maria Montague, Phoebe Page, the entire team, volunteers who do what wonderful work. And by the way, there's an opportunity for you to learn Ukrainian thanks to uh, the Ukrainian Institute London. Uh, they have wonderful classes that I highly recommend. Um, I'd also like to thank you, James. First of all, I'm a great admirer of your work. It's a privilege to sit up here with you. Who are the uh, Crimean Tatars? Very briefly, they're a Sunni Muslim Turkic nation indigenous to Crimea. I think there is a case to make that they are native to Crimea among other indigenous groups, including the Karayim, the Krimchak peoples. Um, and what I'm trying to suggest in this book is that they are actually very instrumental in Ukrainian history. 
So one could argue that without the Crimean Tatars, the Ukrainian nation as we know it, the modern national movement, would not exist. So the Crimean Tatars for centuries had been this emblematic other, um, a group that often raided the Ukrainian lands for slaves in the pre-modern period. Um, but in the 17th century, they became a really emblematic ally of the uh, Cossack movement under Bogdan Khmelnytsky. So were it not for them, it's very likely that the Cossacks would have never succeeded in fighting Polish power. They would have never secured this autonomous hetmanate. And so whether or not independent Ukraine would have emerged um, out of that is a, is a major question. So they are very instrumental in the formation of the Ukrainian national identity for many reasons. And there was really at, at one time a robust Crimean Tatar studies school, um, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s. A wonderful modernist poet and scholar, orientalist polymath named Ahat Angel Krimsky was very clear about the need to study groups like the Crimean Tatars in, in order to understand Ukraine. So one of the interventions I'm trying to make is that studying these groups is not at all studying a marginal nation by any stretch of the imagination, even if they number roughly 250,000 today, but actually their historical presence and their relationships with Ukrainians have been really foundational for what we know as Ukraine today. I'd like you to talk a bit, if you will, um, about the, the tragedy um, which unfortunately uh, it lies at, at the heart of, of contemporary Crimean Tatar consciousness, um, the deportation. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in the, these phrases that you, um, that you use to describe uh, what happened after the deportations, um, ethnic cloning and uh, discursive cleansing. So one thing to understand about the Crimean Tatar deportation in 1944 by Stalin, uh, we can talk about that. But I'd like to maybe step back a little bit and frame the deportation as a broader practice of Russian and Soviet settler colonialism. Not an empire effaces, erases, and replaces an indigenous people. And this actually happens to the Crimean Tatars first after the Crimean War in 1857. The Tsar actually explicitly declares the need for the empire to cleanse uh, the Crimean Tatar population from Crimea. Uh, that's Alexander II. Uh, so Stalin finishes to a degree, or at least tries to finish, what Alexander II started in the 19th century. And he deports the entire Crimean Tatar nation from Crimea in May 1944. It took place over a series of days. Uh, Solzhenitsyn remarks that it took place with the speed of a landing attack. So thousands of NKVD officers um, moved hundreds and thousands of families onto cattle cars where they were shipped off to destinations in Central Asia, Siberia, the Ural Mountains. For 18 days the doors did not open, there was not water, there was not food, so thousands died. And then in so-called special settlement camps in those destinations in the east, they also perished. So it was a remarkable and horrific act of ethnic cleansing after Crimea is cleansed, quote unquote, using Alexander II's terms here, and I understand that that's actually kind of controversial when we co-opt that language. But after that, in, in 1944, you see the Soviet regime begin to just excise any reference to the Crimean Tatars from Crimea. So they had been emblematic in the development and the history of Crimea, but they become deleted. So all their towns, their toponyms, um, they're all changed to these innocuous sounding Russian place names. Is, this is what you call the discursive cleansing. And, and you were talked about this one um, old hack who's given the job of coming up with crappy names for <laughs> these uh, evocative and ancient Crimean Tatar village names. Exactly, yeah. In, in uh, the, the, the autumn of 1944, there's one lowly editor of the newspaper Krasny Krim, the Red Crimea, who's entrusted with renaming um, a massive peninsula and again giving them crappy names. So I mean he didn't he didn't do any work really. He didn't sort of investigate the meaning of the, the Tatar language or even the, the sounds of the of the, the consonants. Um, he didn't look at the history. He didn't, he just he just called them small uh, or that's right. Um, so th th that's that's a great example actually of one village that was called Kitchkene that had a small population of about three hundred people. Um, 
had had a Crimean Tatar cultural inheritance, and this editor just decided to call it uh, Malinkoy, a small, um, because it had 300 people. Um, this was a, a, a rather absurd example. I mean, he, he had some references to, on the one hand, the recent account of the Red Army's advance on Crimea, and he also had a fruticulture book on the other. So if he could refer to a particular kind of flower or a particular kind of plant, he would do so. Um, so that's the, the extent of his uh, reference to any material that reflected knowledge of Crimea. The rest of it was just picking out of a hat, essentially. But the entire cultural background of the peninsula was irrevoc irrevocably changed overnight. And at the same time, all references to the Crimean Tatars removed from the Great Soviet Encyclopedia. Um, they became what Orwell would call unpersons. And um, the uh, ethnic cloning? This has to do with that element of replacing the indigenous population that I mentioned before. So settler colonialism is in the colonialism that seeks to extract surplus labor from indigenous peoples far away. It's about removing them from territory and replacing them with others who are like yourself. So in this case, the Soviet regime repopulated Crimea with Ukrainians and Russians, mostly Russians, but some Ukrainians as well, from different oblasts of Soviet Ukraine and Soviet Russia. So this is what I call ethnic cl uh, cloning that accompanies ethnic cleansing in this case, where Crimea is fashioned into a new Crimea. This is the way the Soviet regime refers to this process after 1944. They talk about this is a process of replacing and changing Crimea into a new Crimea with its own Russian form, quote unquote. And so populating that territory with, with Slavs was their way of doing that. And so today, I think, when we think about Crimea and we wonder why, for instance, many researchers and scholars have referred to Crimea as having this structural predisposition to conflict, in our fields, in history, we haven't necessarily talked about why. What's, what's behind that structure? And what's behind that structure is a history, centuries of ethnic cleansing with the Crimean Tatars at the center. And we've just failed, I think, to acknowledge the fact of that history. And I think in, in focusing on the cultural effects of that ethnic cleansing and that ethnic clone, cloning and discursive cleansing, we can come to grips with contemporary Crimea a little bit more. The subtitle of your book is uh, Stalin's Crimean Atrocity and the Poetics of Solidarity. Um, and I'd like to talk about uh, the Poetics of Solidarity, this, this fascinating, very powerful um, and very hopeful literary argument that you make in the book. Uh, and there are so many extraordinary people in this book, but if there is one central figure, it is this poet, uh, Boris Chichibabin. Um, who was in this interesting starting place of being from Kharkiv, um, which perhaps then more than now is uh, sort of a bit Russian for the Ukrainians and a bit Ukrainian for the Russians. Um, and, and can you talk about his role in, um, in making the, the Tatar cause better known and what came from that? Yeah, Chichibabin is a fascinating figure. As you say, he comes from Kharkiv. He's a Russian language poet. He was very influential in the contemporary poetic world, the underground of Kharkiv, particularly in the 60s and 70s. Um, keeping in mind, of course, that Kharkiv is extremely important to the evolution of the modern Ukrainian national project. So were it not for Kharkiv and Kharkiv University and the almanacs and journals that come out, in the 19th century, the modern Ukrainian national project would have been forever changed. So Kharkiv is really important. But at this time in um, Soviet Kharkiv, Chichibabin was a, a, young, a young poet. He serves in the Second World War on the Trans-Caucasian Front. Um, he begins writing poetry when he returns to do a degree in philology, and his poems catch the eye of the KGB. He's arrested and placed in the Gulag. He's literally pulled out of literature class. And when he comes back, he's scarred from the experience. And one of the first things he does to comfort himself is he goes to Crimea. Because Cri <coughs> Crimea was a place for him um, that engendered these memories of childhood. Um, it was a place that gave him a, a, a lot of comfort. And when he returned there uh, in the late 1940s, he saw that it was completely evacuated of Crimean Tatars, and it shocked him. So he writes this poem called Krimske Progulki, the Crimean Strolls, which has this really innocuous title, but actually it um, focuses 
on the act of the deportation itself and this tragedy of removing forcibly an entire people from the peninsula. <laughs> he was shocked by this atrocity. So he writes this poem and part of the book is tracing where the poem goes. It goes all the way to Central Asia. Uh, it doesn't have his name on it. But the Crimean Tatars who are themselves building and organizing <laughs> this incredible national movement that was the most organized and most influential movement of dissent in Soviet history. That's responsible for spurring so many amazing practices um, in the entire movement of Soviet dissent. Um, it becomes really influential for them. They read it frequently in, uh, before their meetings. It brings them to tears every time. So it's a poem that we can see having this effect in the real world. It not only comforted Crimean Tatars themselves, but also informed readers about an event that was shrouded in secrecy. So the deportation was, was not talked about in Soviet society. Khrushchev did not mention it in the secret speech in 1956, like the Holodomor that we're commemorating tomorrow. It was left out because these are events, the deportation of the Crimean Tatars, Holodomor, that had massive demographic and political uh, effects on the Soviet Union. So Khrushchev left them out. So, the poetics of solidarity, uh, you make this, this very ambitious and beautifully argued case that it is possible, um, perhaps uniquely possible, for literature, and in this case uh, particularly poetry, to move one people to, to care about the fate of, of another people. Mm. Um, and you talk about the difference between guilt and shame and how um, guilt can be a positive emotion, shame more perhaps self-indulgent. Mm -hmm. um, and in your view, um, Chichibabin was, was very much about um, encouraging the, uh, the Soviets people to, to feel guilt for what had happened to the Tatars. Chichibabin was very explicit about this. He was a, a big believer in accepting and embracing guilt and so he was very much ahead of his time because in the field of psychology, particularly in the 1970s and 80s, this is exactly the kind of idea that captivates people like Helen Block Lewis, who does a massive study of the pro-social benefits of guilt uh, relative to shame. So her argument is that guilt actually allows us, in accepting guilt, we enable reparative action. So if we feel guilt, we activate something in ourselves, whereas shame deactivates that impulse. So when we feel shame, we run into a corner, we don't act. Guilt acts differently in that regard. So Chichibabin was uh, very explicit about the acceptance of guilt, particularly with respect to Soviet crimes. And so a lot of his poetry is working to engender in the reader uh, feelings of guilt. Um, and th that engendering is involved really, much, really with this idea of modeling guilt. So um, his poetry ventriloquizes, let's say, the voices of people who are saying they are sorry. And that was incredibly influential. But Bulat Okujava, the uh, late Soviet uh, poet, musician, also, after Chichibaban writes uh, a poem that has a refrain, which is Prastite. He's saying, I'm sorry to the Crimean Tatars. He's, he's facing up to his inaction um, in facing down their struggle and their dispossession. So a lot of this poetry is a poetry of people speaking and, and enunciating um, apologies and genu genuflecting in front of the victim. And that is extremely influential in spurring readers to do something. And sure enough, uh, in the late Soviet period, there were a lot of Soviet citizens from different walks of life who started speaking up uh, in defense of the Crimean Tatar people and their right to return to Crimea in the late 1980s. And so I was really interested for many years in what these poems were doing and how they actually spurred people to action because of course in literature this is the uh, the holy grail we want to understand the things that move us when we read and so this was an example of many different types of poem uh, poets in different countries uh, reacting in a similar way to this event and it's your view that uh, that this movement um, of the Tatars, which um, and, and, and their supporters, which Chichibabin encouraged, um, was actually formative in the wider dissident movement and foundational to it, really. 
Absolutely. The, the Crimean Tatars were, again, not only the most organized uh, and most influential movement of dissent in the entire history of the Soviet Union, but they had um, in, incredible effects on Soviet dissent as a whole. So one example is the, the prominent uh, so-called Sam, Samizdat or Samvidav journal, The Chronicle of Current Events which was extremely active after 1968 into the 1980s. And for those of you who've ever encountered this journal, it's a very dry clinical chronicle of this person was arrested for this particular act, um, devoid of much emotion, much sentiment. And this was a journal that was inspired directly from um, a uh, similar chronicle that the Crimean Tatar movement had, had produced a decade before, and uh, Natalia Gobranevskaya, who is the editor of the Chronicle of Current Events, acknowledged the indebtedness of the Crimean Tatar example for that journal. And there was also an example of the so-called initiative groups of the Crimean Tatar people that led to um, a uh, autonomous NGO in the late Soviet period called the Initiative Group for human rights. So you can see their effects and their influence in many places. It was really profound, but I think uh, Sovietology in the West was hesitant at times to acknowledge it. I, I'm fascinated with this, um, with this, this argument, this idea um, of the poetic sol of solidarity. And when I was thinking about this event, um, I, was, I was quite worried because I was thinking, well, I, I really want to talk about, about that um, literary political argument. Um, but here we are um, in the middle of this um, appalling invasion. Um, and, and maybe what the audience is really interested in hearing about is, you know, how many, how many high Mars batteries does Ukraine need to, uh, to take back Sevastopol? Um, but I found that there is very much a meeting point in your book. Um, and there's, a, there's a, a passage where you talk about um, Chichi Babin's effect um, and, and how he uh, encouraged people to, to feel guilty for the Tatars, even though it wasn't literally their responsibility. And you'd say it wasn't, people began to understand it wasn't just Stalin, it was also them. And of course, this is the argument that you hear a lot particularly from Ukrainians, um, it's, it's not enough just to say it's Putin's fault and it's not the Russians' fault. They, they, they also need to, to, uh, to feel a sense of positive um, guilt. Um, but is it possible that something similar might happen? Where, where is the poetics? Where is the solidarity now? Um, could, could, are we going to see poetics on, on Telegram? Um, are we going to see solidarity coming out of um, uh, some kind of um, uh, Sam is that sitcom on YouTube? Uh, what, what do you think are the, uh, are the prospects for some, somebody like Chichi Babin to come along and, and wake the Russians, to, to, to put it kindly, from this appalling spell that they seem to have fallen under? It's a great question. It took 15 years in his case, so he writes Crimean Strolls in 1959. The deportation had taken place 15 years prior to that. So I, I shudder to think about how long it might take in this case for similar stirring calls for solidarity and again, acceptance and embrace of guilt. I haven't seen much of it from the Russian side and it's exactly right that we need to see that from the Russian side and that there is criminal guilt as the philosopher uh, Karl Jaspers puts it and there's also collective guilt and that's the kind of guilt that Chichibabin expresses uh, some hope for. And it's worth noting as well that the Ukrainian general Petro Grigorenko was also someone who wrote a great deal about how the Soviet regime actually um, works to remove guilt from the Soviet citizen. That it seeks to defeat the feeling of guilt, to make you guiltless. So in Soviet descent there is a history and a past and a precedent in which this question of guilt has already been answered. And it's been rather shocking to see how, particularly in the Russian liberal intelligentsia, how that hasn't been a go-to resource for them at all, at least from what I've seen. Uh, as um, I'm sure the, most of the audience will know, um, the, the pressure, the campaign, and, and in the end, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, or rather somewhat before the collapse of the Soviet Union, that all worked in the sense that uh, the Tatars came back. Those who survived, their, their children, 
Um, some of them got back to a homeland that they'd, they'd never seen. Um, I mean, I, I haven't been to Crimea for a long time, but I, I visited quite a lot in the 1990s. And when I'm, on one of my first trips, I remember going to, it was winter, and there was a field, and there were just Tatars with their, um, all their possessions in railway containers shipped from Central Asia, just sitting in this field. Mm. Uh, and I, I met um, some sort of Tatar activists, but the woman who made the greatest impression on me was a, a, um, a, a middle-aged Tatar woman who, in the middle of this field, out of her railway wagon, with all her goods in packing crates around, she insisted on making me a cup of tea. And she <laughs> dug into the packing crates and pulled out these exquisite china saucers and cups. Wow. Uh, and at the time, I thought, what a, what a wonderful act of hospitality. Yeah. But perhaps it went deeper than that. Perhaps she wanted to, to impress upon the visitor that this was her home. You were the guest, yeah, and she was the host, absolutely. I think uh, the, the notion of Crimea as the home of the Crimean Tatars is extremely deeply entrenched in their national culture, in their national literature, and in their language. It's difficult for us to overstate just how important it is. And in, after 1991, so they begin to return in the late Soviet period, the Politburo even mentions that this event was horrific. So they confront the evil, effectively, of the deportation in their own official explicit pronouncements about it. But nonetheless, after 1991, when the Soviet Union falls, Crimea changes irrevocably. And there isn't a frame, and this is where, again, I think we in the West bear some responsibility and scholarship for not facing up to the need for us to talk about decolonization and to be talking about the fact of settler colonialism in places like Crimea and not only so that we could actually use tried and true mechanisms that we've seen work in other places. Australia is a good example, and to a degree in the United States, where things like electoral quotas, truth and reconciliation commissions, um, official apologies, they should have been used and we should have used them um, in our discourse to encourage politicians in this space to take these measures. I think they would have gone a long way to healing some of these wounds. Instead, the, the fact of the deportation and the chauvinism towards the Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians um, was allowed to fester. And we now see just how dangerous that, that, that's become. Um, so after 91, we see Crimea is the story of three alienated peoples, Crimean Tatars, Ukrainians, Russians, who navigate these various interests but we didn't talk about these nested post-colonialisms that they all um, experience and they are all living out. And I think that was just a wound that we never sought to address at all. And uh, now we're seeing after 2014 how our amnesia about Crimea has led the peninsula to become highly militarized, how it's become a springboard for the military to invade after the 24th of February, mainland Ukraine, and at the same time, it's become this outpost for things like Russian passports being brought into now occupied parts of southern Ukraine, or teachers that are brought from Crimea into places like occupied Kherson. So it's become this peninsula that is a great threat to Ukraine. And meanwhile, we in the West uh, just considered it all done and dusted. We had. Uh, international relations theorists like John Mearsheimer, who does this profession no favor, say that this is all done and Crimea is surely lost for good. So in 2018, since we talked about football, uh, the, the tournament was held in, in Russia. There was little consequence for this massive militarization, not only of, um, of territory, but also of consciousness. And that's where I think this begins with the story of first this ethnic cleansing and why Crimea has been so structurally predisposed to conflict and we just need to acknowledge it properly. I'd like to talk a bit about the relations between um, Ukraine uh, and the, the rest of Ukraine and Crimea um, after 1991 and before the annexation of the peninsula by, by Russia in 2014. Um, th there is this, this phenomenon um, in nationalisms, shall we say. Um, Scottish nationalists quite often, they are very, very ready to embrace all the, what they see as the positive elements of their past. Uh, William Wallace, Robert the Bruce, uh, 
Um, we invented this, we invented that, but less uh, ready to acknowledge, for example, the role of Scots in the British Empire, in, mm -hmm. in being colonialists. Mm -hmm. um, and I do feel that now, after what's happened uh, with the invasion, that it, it's good to be much more precise about Soviet Ukraine and Soviet Russia. Mm -hmm. um, but in the Soviet Union as a whole, there were, of course, a very, very large number of Ukrainians who, who bought into it mm -hmm. and, who, and who became good Soviet citizens, whatever that means, and, um, and were part of the project. And just because somebody has a, um, a Ukrainian stamp in their passport and they live in Crimea, doesn't mean that they're necessarily on board with, with the idea of um, of, of uh, Ukrainian statehood. Um, so what I'm leaning up to is, is what, um, what could we say about the relations between um, the new Ukrainian state and Crimea and the Crimean Tatars in particular in those, those years from 1991 to 2014? Mm. Well, I, I would say there, first of all, I'm, I'm really pleased that you're addressing this question of nationalisms and the commonalities that we all, we all, um, we all can encounter in different nationalisms. And I would say that in the Soviet period, professed Ukrainian nationalists often, as you said, spoke very uh, stridently about the crime of the Crimean Tatar deportation. And dissidents like um, Ivan Sokulsky, uh, who is from Dnipropetrovsk, today's uh, Dnipro, or Mykola Rodenko, who eventually became head of the um, Helsinki Watch Group in Ukraine. They were very interested in exploring the questions of complicity and guilt in their own relationships with Crimean Tatars. And so their poetry becomes a venue to talk about these things in a safe space. So they confront this issue of being tied up in subjugating another with whom you feel solidarity. And obviously in the Ukrainian case, due to its strong anti-colonial backbone, that was a very important thing for them to, to confront. And that kind of literature that's honest, that's difficult, um, I think became after 91 a resource for a lot of Crimeans of Ukrainian ancestry uh, who wanted to establish productive relations with Crimean Tatars and find common cause with them as this new Crimea emerged and developed. So I would say if we try to look at this from an abstract conceptual perspective, what we can see between Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars after 91 is first there's this discourse of encounter. So first there's this return to the past of the 17th century when Again, the Crimean Tatars were aligned with the Ukrainian Cossacks in this fight against Polish power. So there's a return to this idea. What was our alliance about? Why did we come together? Uh, so that's the encounter. But then later, uh, as the years progress, we see more of a discourse of entanglement. So um, there's a brilliant film by Ole Sanin called Mamai, which is about a young He's a Russian Cossack who loses his way, falls in love with a Crimean Tatar woman, and slips between these different identities that for many were taken for granted at this time. So entanglement becomes a major theme. And now what we're seeing in contemporary Ukrainian culture is more a discourse of enclosure. You have Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians talking about what it means to be at home with each other. Um, a brilliant film by Naraman Aliyev, who is subject of an interview that the Ukrainian Institute London uh, hosted and organized. Uh, has a film called uh, Evge, Dodomo, Homeward. And it's about this, this, uh, this journey of coming home to Crimea, what it means to be at home, and the relationship between Ukrainians and, and the Crimean Tatars. I would say right now, it's an absolutely inspiring collaboration, and that the Crimean Tatars right now are a force um, powering, in many ways, civic national identity in Ukraine, which is, I think, for us, here in Europe House, a remarkable thing to, to imagine a Sunni Muslim national minority that's helping derive a very strident Ukrainian civic national identity that, that believes that one can become Ukrainian, that you can be any ethnicity and become Ukrainian. So Crimean Tatars are really instrumental in that idea. As far as I understand it, well, I understand it from your book, the, um, one of the uh, sticking points in relations between Tatars and Ukrainians before 2014 was um, Ukraine, Kiev, dragging its feet on uh, giving the 
uh, Crimean Tatars the status of of an indigenous people, which which they've now done rather rather late, um, and. Uh, it was mooted, and I, I guess it's still on the table for a future Crimea within Ukraine, um, the idea of, um, of an autonomous uh, Crimea, an autonomous uh, Tatar Crimea uh, named as such within Ukraine. Um, can you talk a bit about, about what happened then? I mean, it, it is a, there's an interesting footnote in that, isn't it? Because that law really got under... Putin's skin for a sort of mad reason. He completely misunderstood it. Uh. This, this discussion about the politics of a Tatar Crimea was very, very tricky before 2014, largely because it also carried with it discussions about federalizing Ukraine. And those of us who are observers of Ukrainian politics know that federalizing Ukraine um, meant something very different from the Kremlin's point of view, it meant partitioning effectively Ukraine and making it dysfunctional. Um, others thought of federalization more like decentralization, which was something that was pursued more stridently. So the Crimean Tatar question for Kyiv has always been uh, a very difficult one before 2014. Uh, it's led to a lot of hugely tragic political results. So in 1998, for instance, um, Kyiv allowed something like 30,000 Crimean Tatars to be left off electoral rolls so they could not vote in local Crimean elections. So there's a really complicated political landscape here where local Crimean elites disenfranchised very often Crimean Tatars and ethnic Ukrainians on the peninsula. And sometimes Kyiv went along with that disenfranchisement. Sometimes they sought to fight it. So President Yushchenko, for instance, after 2004, at times did um, seek to establish more of a centralized control in Crimea. But at this time, it was still an autonomous republic, had much more leeway to do what it wanted. So the Crimean Tatar issue is always a, a, um, a, a, a choppy um, theme for, for everyone. So I think after 2014, as you said, James, you're right, it was, uh, it was late. You know, after the annexation operation of March 2014 to finally give this recognition to the Crimean Tatars that they were an indigenous people of Ukraine was, um, was, was tragic almost. National territorial autonomy for the Crimean Tatars in Crimea is a widely accepted position among Ukrainians today and majority support it. This is something that the Crimean platform, which was started um, over a year ago, well, I'll see now, um, over a year ago, um, an initiative of the Office of the President, Volodymyr Zelensky, which is in many respects bringing international actors to focus on, one, that Crimea is of course um, sovereign Ukrainian territory, but two, to get them thinking about what it will mean when deoccupation will occur, um, what is involved when deoccupation will occur. And I have no doubt it will. It's a question of, of, of time. So they're already starting these conversations. And one of them, I think, one of these conversations will ultimately revolve around this question of national territorial autonomy. I think they won't have any excuses, really, to not offer it to them. Do you have any information from your, your sources um, about what it's, what it's like for Crimean Tatars in Crimea right now, because I can one imagines that there must be uh, some who would like to help Ukraine, um, perhaps in a sense, of, in a sort of partisan sense, uh, but perhaps in the back of their mind, they don't want to give the Russians the excuse for a, another deportation. There are many, many Crimean Tatar activists who've been held in prison who have been sentenced to draconian um, years in prison. Uh, this has been a problem since 2014. It, we've let effectively Crimea become this gray zone where there is a suspension of human rights protocols. It's become so draconian, it's almost hard to, to, to follow it and it's hard to witness it. Um, there's a general sense of helplessness. I know for a, for a lot of members of the Crimean Tatar Mejlis, there's a recognition that their fight in the Soviet period, in some respects, was not as difficult as this one. That is, they were worried more about the Kremlin now being um, less reasonable, about being more violent. And so there have been still 
um, a number of cases in which Crimean Tatar men in particular and women, but men are the ones that are getting pulled out of their houses and sent to prison. Um, one of them is named Bogdan Azizov, who in May threw uh, yellow and blue paint at the local administration building in Yevpatoria. He also threw a Molotov cocktail at it as well. Um, and he was arrested in, I think, the first or one of the first arrests that came out of a March law that was against the so-called discrediting of the armed forces of the Russian Federation. So there have been at least 134 arrests um, under this law since the start of the full-scale invasion on the 24th of February. About 111 are Crimean Tatar men. And have they been subject to conscription? They have. And so this has become, um, it's of course, a war crime. And, you know, it's high time we in the West use these terms with much more frequently than we, the frequency, frequency than we do. There we. are so many crimes. <laughs> there there are, it's, there are. it's all a crime. Yeah, it is. Um, but this, this uh, mobilization of Crimean Tatars, uh, particularly in the first weeks after the announcement of the so-called partial mobilization, uh, they receive something like 90% of the mobilization orders in the first few weeks. So you can see these uh, acts of cascading genocide, we might say, um, and they've affected the Crimean Tatars first in that part of, of Ukraine. So um, you start your, your book uh, on a very broad canvas, um, and, and I'd like to just broaden it out a bit. Um, you, you talk about Crimea as being at the center of this, this Black Sea world. Mm. Um, and you talk about Russia, Ukraine, and Turkey. Um, you don't talk about Bulgaria, Romania, and Georgia. <laughs> they, I think they might feel a bit left out. Yeah, I have a footnote um, about that. <laughs> okay, I, I, yeah, missed the footnote. I, I admit that I, I leave them out, yeah. <laughs> if uh, Neil Asherson was here, he would probably put his hand up and say, what about, what about Abkhazia? Mm -hmm. um, but the intellectual relationship between Turkey and Crimea is absolutely fascinating and then this was a revelation for me um, all these uh, the, the story about this newspaper that was um, as you say I think the, the at the center of, of the Muslim world for for a period of time um, the fact that um, the current president of Turkey was arrested for reading out a, a, a um, was it a Crimean poem or a Turkish poem about Crimea? It was a Turkish poem, not about Crimea, but about this um, mythical uh, land and political project called Turan. So not necessarily about Crimea, but it is an example of, you know, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Crimea, back when he was um, mayor of Istanbul, reading out a poem and getting arrested for it. Just an example of how literature matters in this region of the world. It matters much more than it does here. And um, that cuts to this question of what literature can do in the, empir in the empir empirical world. But the, um, can you talk a bit about the, um, the place of, of Crimea in the, in the Turkish imagination and how, how that played out in the past and how it plays out today? I start in the 18th century because uh, when Crimea is annexed by Catherine II in 1783, it comes after four invasions. So one reads of traditional Russian historiography, it's as if in 1783 the Crimean Tatar Khanate voluntarily decides to dissolve itself and join the great Russian Empire. Of course, it came after these four invasions. Um, Catherine uh, absorbs the Khanate, dismantles it. And remarkably, when I was looking through Ottoman sources at this time, they don't accept it. They still think that uh, this is a state that is aligned with them. And they summon, years after, 1783, I think it's 1785, they summon a brain trust in Istanbul to talk about this problem of Russians who are seeking to control the Black Sea region. <clears throat> so Crimea is something for them in the 17th, 18th century in particular that they feel is part of their space. And there's frequently talk of the Black Sea being a Turkish lake. Um, so that's a very pregnant idea and one that we don't see uh, leave us in the 19th, although by the middle of the 19th century, as we know, Crimea becomes the site of this imperial clash of the titans in the Crimean War. And I think that's actually had really uh, powerful resonance here in this country, because if we think about the Crimean War taking place in the middle of the 19th century, 
really 60 years or so after the annexation of Crimea and the dismantling of the Crimean Tatar Khanate. Um, one needs to wonder why is it that in this country we always think of Crimea as somehow Russian, when actually it had just entered their, their space in the middle of the 19th century. And what becomes clear is that this war, which was often referred to as the first armchair war, that is, people could read about it in something akin to real time by way of these new technologies of the telegraph. So Crimea enters the public consciousness as Russian in some way in this country, and that's had profound implications for us. So this, this prior history that's connected to Ottoman Turkey is often left out of the picture and comes as a, as a surprise to some that the uh, that Crimea had been a part of the Crimean Tatar Khanate for centuries. And actually, when we understand the history of the Khanate, we can understand why Crimea and Kherson and where this front is right now, why we need to think about this entire region much, much, much differently. Because the Khanate frame Crimea not only as a peninsula, but as a peninsula and the southern steppelin of today's Ukraine. And so their borders are effectively what we're seeing right now at the center of this war. And the territory of the peninsula and the steppelin were never really divided between comp competing states for, for very long. So when Putin engages in this occupation and annexa annexation operation of, of 2014, we should have known right away that things were going to escalate because he never secured that territory that the Khanate always had, which was the fresh water of the southern steppelin. <coughs> So, um, to answer your question though, very, very quickly, in the 20th century for Turkey and for Turkish literature, Crimea and the Crimean Tatars offer them access to um, stories and narratives about the Second World War, because as we know, Turkey was neutral in the Second World War. The Crimean Tatars become characters that allow them access to this global event. And so, the connection of the Crimean Tatars to Turkish culture is very profound, and it's bound up in these questions of victimization and wartime violence. And so if we don't understand how key the Crimean Tatar community is in, in Turkey, we fail to understand how significant Crimea is as a geopolitical flashpoint, because it's not simply um, a relationship between Ukrainians, Crimean Tatars, and Russians. The uh, Turks have a lot invested and a lot at stake in this, in this too. Well, on a practical level, does that have meaning for, for Ukraine in its, in its search for, for allies and assistance? I mean, it's quite hard to follow the twists and turns of, of the Turkish policy, and uh, they do seem to be playing both ends against the middle, rather. Uh, they, they're opening, keeping the channels open with Putin. I, I think they even talked about, um, uh, yes, they're talking about energy cooperation with him, but at the same time, they've made it clear they have every intention of going on supplying um, weapons to, to Ukraine. Um, I mean, where does the, um, where does Crimea fits into into this? Is, is it some leverage that Ukraine can use or would that be a bad idea? Um, I think it's a very important idea. I think it should be used more often and should have been used much more often prior to the advent of the full-scale invasion on the 24th of February. I think, I think failing to see the Black Sea region as a connected region you know, we typically see the sea as dividing countries rather than joining them. I think that's an intellectual failure. I think we, we need to think about the sea joining these places and these peoples. And a lot of the book is about people crossing the Black Sea and mixing and sharing ideas and different, different identity projects. And this is something I think the Ukrainian state could have leaned into much more uh, prior to 2014. We could have led much more with that Crimean Tatar inheritance as a way of really establishing with Turkey better relationships. Because they do it occasionally, but they don't make it a foundational relationship that, um, that could have positively allowed them to outmaneuver uh, so-called pro-Russian forces on the peninsula. I guess one way of characterizing the sort of, um, I mean, it's unfortunate that Mirs Hymas always gets dragged into this because he's not the only one, and he is one of the more extreme people who are putting this point of view. Um, but the basic idea seems to be that, that peace is preferable to um, restorative justice. Um, and I don't agree with Mirs Hymer, and I don't agree with most of the, the so-called realist school. But in an abstract sense, restorative justice in terms of who lives where, uh, 
and who controls where is an extremely difficult concept. Uh, and Ukraine, the larger Ukraine, um, has to contemplate this in its, in its history. At the moment, they're getting a lot of help from Poland, but Poland has its own um, complex relationship to the territory of, of what is now Ukraine. Um, they're not getting help from Hungary because Hungary has the same complex relationship. Um, and I guess one of the reasons why perhaps they're not pushing harder on the Turkish claim to um, whatever claim the Turks might have to Crimea is because they don't want, they don't want Turkey to, to get its, its paws on Crimea either. Um, I mean, um, I've just been reading this extraordinary novel by um, Olga Tokarczuk, um, The Books of Jacob. And it is extraordinary to read this, this wonderful, wonderful book, um, which I have not yet finished, so no spoilers. Um, but uh, this territory of uh, right bank Ukraine, um, where there the Ukrainians, if they are there at all, are only mentioned as the peasants. Um, and um, warmly, but very remotely, and it's all about the relationship between between Jews and other Jews, and between Jews and and Poles, and it, and it is basically a a Polish Jewish area, and that's all gone. Um, and and where is the restorative justice um, to be had there? It's 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 we've we've moved on. Um, it's it's unfair. Um, it's unfair that the that the Jews were killed. Um, and it's, it's probably unfair that the, the Poles were, were pushed west. Um, but it gets you into these very, very difficult questions of, for example, how long does a group have to live in an area before they have some claim on, on that area? Um, and uh, how, does that, how can that be, um, be made right in whatever future Crimea we end up with. I think using the past as a way of determining the political future is always dangerous. I think our colleague Timothy Snyder at Yale University speaks really eloquently about this problem. The more we use history as fodder for our political interactions, the more we end up um, with situations like these. I mean, the, the, the preeminent example of someone who's at least purportedly using the past to justify violence against children and innocent civilians in the present is Vladimir Putin. So I think what we need to focus on are the principles of sovereignty and international law that got us here in the first place. And that's why I think uh, the, the borders of independent sovereign Ukraine need to be restored, including Crimea. I don't think we'll ever get back um, to any semblance of stability without that happening. And again, I'm, I'm fairly confident it will. It's just a matter, matter of time. And I think it's going to be something that is, we're going to see unfolding gradually and then occurring suddenly. So I would say sticking to our principles, letting history inform us, particularly histories of these relationships of more constructive solidarity and fellowship that are evident in culture but not in IR theory. I mean, the international relations theory is bereft of language, much knowledge of language and culture and local history, and it looks at, uh, looks at human relationships like uh, a board game. And I think we give them way too much of a platform, and I'm sorry I raised, <laughs> raised Mearsheimer's name because I was the one who did it. But um, I think focusing more on these interrelationships that we feel are articulated in poetry and prose that speak to this past of connection between, between these groups is, is a much more um, healthy and robust way of conceiving and envisioning a political future. So I, that's, that's what I'd say about that, James. I happened to be on, um, uh, in, in, in Kiev when the annexation of, of Crimea took place. It was um, not long after uh, Yanukovych had, had run away. Uh, and so, of course, I asked people what they thought about, about what was happening in Crimea. Um, and I remember this one guy who'd, who'd fought on the Maidan, and he was there when the tented encampment was still in place. Um, and he just said, Jalka Tatarum, he said, now, which I took to mean, perhaps wrongly, but he, I took to mean that he, Jalka uh, Tatarum, um, shame, shame about the Tatars, uh, which I took to mean, I am sorry about the Tatars, but losing Crimea may be the price we have to pay to have um, a free Ukraine. Um, that was how I interpreted it. Um, and I, I heard that, you know, either explicitly or, or implicitly from, from various people at that time. 
Um, and um, but of, I guess now things things have changed. But and perhaps that wasn't really either a right or a genuine feeling in the country that, uh, then. I think if we we think back to that period. There was just an absence, a complete lack of a military response, and I do think the West bears responsibility for very vocally and stridently telling Kiev to stand down and to not have this escalate any further. So we have plenty of examples in which um, the Obama administration did not um, counsel the Ukrainian side to actually take measures that would have been more defensive and instead to sit back and let it happen. So I think that that's a very regrettable thing. And in Ukrainian culture, we can see right now this uh, this searching and this journey in understanding what Crimea meant to them. Um, it's widely thought of as a, as a wound, it's something that started this process. And it's not for nothing that uh, someone that we've both spoken to, Mustafa Jamilev and, and President Volodymyr Zelensky, speak about the war beginning in Crimea and the need for it to end in Crimea as well. One of the moments I focus on in the book is how let's say, literary communities in Kyiv, in Kharkiv, and Lviv didn't see the Ukrainian language culture on the peninsula in the 1990s and uh, in the early 2000s. They, they, they often spoke about um, the lack of Ukrainian Crimea when, in fact, there was a very large community of poets in the Ukrainian language writing about Crimea, people like Danilo, Danilo Kononenko, Ores Korsovetsky. They published anthologies and collections in the Ukrainian language about Crimea. But these things were not well known elsewhere in Ukraine. And that's, that's regrettable. And there was a certain sense that um, there wasn't much happening with Ukrainian language culture in Crimea. And those groups have been abandoned in, in many ways. And I think that's, that's been realized. I mean, I think if we, if we look at wonderful writers like uh, Katerina Kalitko and others who've, who've really done some soul searching about what's happened. Why was it the case that Crimea was let go in the way that it was? And how is it attached to everything that's happened since? So that's the kind of journey that so much of Ukrainian culture is undertaking at the moment. I think it's extremely helpful. And obviously, the Crimean Tatars are a big part of that whole exchange. At the moment, as things stand, um, they are a, a minority, in an ethnic minority within Crimea. Um, do you, in, in a sort of utopian uh, world where um, the Russians somehow just melt away, the, the Russian military that is, um, and uh, the, the people of Crimea and uh, Ukraine as a whole can sit down and work out some future for, um, for Crimea, what um, is your view for how that might uh, most fruitfully develop? The initiative I spoke of earlier, the Crimean platform, that was again started by President Volodymyr Zelensky's office has a step-by-step -step plan for for this utopian uh, this utopian future, um, and I would say it's actually more realistic um, than we think. Um, the first the first step is of course confronting, by way of a military civilian administration, those who have actively aided and abetted a Russian Federation that has committed egregious human rights abuses um, from 2014 on. And then, at the same time, providing for mechanisms of illustration and finding ways to uh, bring in effectively almost a shadow government that's being prepared at the moment, kind of what they call a human resources pool of experts who can come in and right from the start on the ground provide services to people, restore rights to people, give a sense of legitimacy that Kiev, I think, can do, but it's going to take some time. And I think the key relationship will be the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian Crimean Tatar relationship. If if that continues to be one propelling this notion uh, that is the predominant historical identity project in Ukraine of a civic national identity, um, I think it will restore a sense that rights can be protected by Kyiv, um, that you, that Crimea's specificity and uniqueness can be protected. Obviously, there's going to be a lot with respect to those Russians who've come to Crimea since 2014 um, and what they have to show to have any stake in the future of the peninsula.
Thank you very much. Uh, that seems like a, a good moment to open the floor up to um, the questions, um, if anyone has any. I mean, normally I say please questions and not statements, but uh, if there are any Crimean Tatars in the audience, then feel free to, uh, to vent your, your thoughts. Just take one more thing. Uh, <coughs> thank you so much to both of you for such uh, an amazing uh, discussion, and uh, I can't wait to read it. Um, I want to ask you about uh, translation. Um, we were talking just before this about translation, uh, and you know one of the things we've been trying to do a lot, those of us who study uh, Ukraine and try to put more sculptures, translate things into English. But I'm wondering, you're, you're talking in the book about writers and dissidents who are working in Russian and in Ukrainian and in Crimean Tatar, and Probably you've got people working in Turkish in there as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, what have you found in the, uh, about the importance of translation between these languages? In what sense are they, are they speaking to one another? In what sense are the readers of Ukrainian reading things that were written in Tatar, or the other way around, or Russian? Um, and also, how, how, do you, how do you see the importance today? You know, because it's it's one thing that's quite been quite striking when you go to Ukraine, like you know, the, the kind of book publishing industry has really developed in recent years. Uh, translation into Ukrainian has developed, um, but there there isn't much of Crimean Tatar literature translated into Ukrainian for Ukrainian readers. There is some, but it's literally in the last few years that these things, nice mm. editions, have started to be published. Mm. So I'd be interested to hear what you uh, tell us about. Such a, such a great question. Thanks for that, William. I think, first of all, the growth and development and maturation of the Ukrainian publishing industry, which I, I would say in the past 10 years has just skyrocketed, as you know better than anyone, um, also involves us recognizing that, let's say, in the 1990s, the first decade of the 21st century, it wasn't as robust. And that's why, for instance, these massive anthologies, bilingual anthologies by Yunus Kandim, and Mikola Miroshnichenko didn't really get around um, and certainly didn't get around Ukraine to the extent that it could they could have. And so these are really big bilingual anthologies of Crimean Tatar literature translated into Ukrainian. Sometimes the translations are, are fairly poor, but the, the attempt is to render sense. And these just weren't widely read. Since 2000 and... Um, 2019, I believe, there's been a wonderful collaboration led by um, Crimea House in Kyiv, which is uh, a wonderful organization led by the filmmaker, filmmaker Akhtem Setablayev and then a wonderful Crimean Tatar activist who's also associated with the Crime, uh, Ukrainian Institute, not Ukrainian Institute London, but Ukrainian Institute, named Ali Maliev. And they recently have published wonderful editions uh, called Krimsky Injir. So they have this, this festival in which Crimean Tatar and Ukrainian literature are celebrated together, where new writing about Crimea, about their relationships, are published. And these are really attractive volumes. They're widely available now in different bookstores. Um, so I think. If only the publishing ind industry had been a little more supple and well-funded to do some of that work with Kandim and Miroshchenko's volumes, I think um, that would have gone quite far in establishing even more of a, of a, a strident uh, sense of solidarity between Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars. But to your question about Turkey, actually, and James asked this earlier, William, the, the Crimean Tatar literature and Turkish literature are tightly intertwined partly due to translation projects between the two contexts, but also because one of the most popular Turkish writers was a Crimean Tatar who never stepped foot in Turkey. His name is Cengiz Daji, and he's written these uh, very popular um, works about Crimean Tatars in wartime that were widely read by Erdogan, um, by Devat Olu, the foreign minister. They're kind of the things that every Turkish student reads in secondary school. So that connection, um, to a degree, one of translation, because Daji spoke Crimean Tatar, his Turkish initially, before he came to this country, he actually settles in Wimbledon. Um, uh, his Turkish evolved with assistance of an editor. So there was an interesting relationship of translation there of a sort. Thank you.
Yes, we have a question here. Thank you very much for this very interesting conversation. Um, I have two questions, if I may. The first one is, if we go, could go back to that point that you made about how a durable, sustainable peace can only be possible if Crimea is also liberated. But my impression is a little bit that even the people that are now convinced of the need to support Ukraine militarily in order to strengthen its position at whatever negotiation table is going to happen, uh, still, Crimea seems to be that concession that many things Ukraine should be ready to make. And Crimean Tatars' voices are completely left out. So what can we say in order to you know, strengthen that argument that it's necessary to liberate Crimea as part of a you know, durable peace settlement? And the second one is about that relationship between guilt and shame that you were talking about before. My impression from you know any interviews that are out there about Russians, especially <coughs> the Russian diaspora, they always talk about shame, never guilt. They talk about how they're ashamed of being associated currently with a Russian identity and they struggle to cope with it. So what has to happen in Russia for that transition to happen? Because I don't think it's just a generational issue. We see a huge militarization of youth, you know, with paramilitary movements such as the young army. <laughs> They're seeking to recruit one million new, basically, soldiers by 2030. So what has to happen inside of Russia, you know, to facilitate that process? Thank you. Let me try to take the second question first. And in full disclosure, I'm not at all a Russian expert. So um, I would say just based on the, the, the Soviet-Russian dissident figures that I write about in the book, um, I think what you've just raised, Yaroslava, about this issue of shame, it's not for nothing that we're not seeing much action and much initiative taken by the Russians who have left Russia. We don't see these massive demonstrations in which they stand up to their own regime. And I wonder whether shame is part of that inaction. That's certainly how Gurgarenko and Tijipabin and others might think of it. Um, I find it hard at the same time to personally, emotionally speak about only guilt in this case. I think they should feel a deep, uh, unabiding shame. Um, so I'm not sure how to answer that question. I do think it might be that we try to open a space in which more of guilt can be discussed and processed rather than shame being at the center of things. As far as Crimea, I'm very optimistic about this. I think because there was the first parliamentary summit of the Crimean platform and there scores of world leaders were coming and not only were they learning things like Slava Ukraini, which increasingly um, foreign ministers and heads of state say very, very well, um, there, there was um, also, I think, a clear-eyed view that this future of Ukrainian Crimea um, is imminent in one way or another. Um, however, that, we, we don't know how it happens. The one thing I would say is we need to return to the language that was used in 1954 by Soviet Russian politicians. Uh, I'll give you one example. Mikhail Tarasov, who in the Politburo talked about Crimea <laughs> being the, quote, natural continuation of Ukraine's southern steppe. So this was the language and the explanation used in 1954 by Soviet elites to explain why Crimea should be given from Soviet Russia to Soviet Ukraine. It wasn't a gift. It wasn't because of the Treaty of Paryaslav of 1654, it was because Crimea was suffering economically and there was a, there was a wide, widely held understanding that Soviet Ukraine would handle Crimea better, resurrect its economy after the Second World War and of course after the deportation of the Crimean Tatars which removed this indigenous people who were so instrumental to its agricultural sector, to its tobacco industry in particular. Um, and somehow, for whatever reason, in our field, we've taken the bait on this question of a gift, when actually, if we look at Soviet explanations for this transfer in 1954, they were all about um, reviving the economy. And the explanation was that this makes logistical sense. Crimea, after all, is not connected to Russia. It's connected to Ukraine. And as I mentioned before, when we take a look at Crimean Tatar history, when we don't just consign it to the margins, but bring it to the center, we realize that the peninsula, as we think of it, was more than a peninsula. And it needs that territory of the southern steppes. It needs that freshwater supply. So if we are talking about 
returning Kherson and all of Kherson'shchina to Ukraine. Naturally, therefore, I think we need to be thinking about Crimea too. And I, I, I'm, I'm of the view that Ukraine's leadership gets this. And I also think the international community, at least those diplomats that I saw, also get it too. And that, that's encouraging. I, I'm, I'm not aware of, at the moment, how well controlled the, north, the, the opening of North Crimean Canal is. But it's certainly within range now of Ukrainian forces. So the problem is, you know, if, if, you, if you take the canal, you have to take it, secure it, and then recreate the dam. So I think that's going to be very difficult to do without really pushing farther in um, to these areas of occupied um, southern Ukraine. But it, it's, again, I think only a matter of time. Um, and really, we need to bring Crimea back in the picture. I feel like we've completely forgotten about it. And when one looks from this long historical perspective, we realize how tightly connected these spaces are. We shouldn't buy into this idea of just this peninsula that's floating out in the Black Sea like an island, which is, of course, how um, Vasily Aksyonov uh, thought of it in the 1980s when he wrote uh, a novel called Ostrov Krim, the, the, the Crimea island. So, uh, yeah, we need to shake and change these bad habits and, and reconceive this region. And I think once we do, we can see how Ukraine can, can win. Just uh, before we go to the next question, can I just um, clarify one, one point? Um, when, at the point that the Tatars were deported, um, were they closer to being a majority in the, in the peninsula or had the, the sort of um, the colonization already shrunk their, their space? They had, they had um, to that point in 1944, they decreased to a minority. So the effect of, again, Alexander II, the Tsar using the term achishtenia, cleansing of the Crimean Tatar people, was very impactful. Recall that in the Crimean War, of course, Russia lost decisively. They were humiliated, in fact, in their defeat. The Crimean Tatars became a scapegoat, convenient scapegoat. They became the reason why. Russian military power suffered. Um, and so they were expelled, many of them. A lot of them were forced to, to emigrate um, to Ottoman Turkey, to what they called the Aktoprak, the white land of, of the uh, Ottoman Empire. And that was a very impactful process and practice that took place over a century. But even then, when you think about just how profound those migrations were, how many Crimea Tatar folk songs are about the, the, the tragedy of that departure and that journey, even still in 1944, um, if you look at uh, Soviet sources in the 1930s, and particularly in the 1920s, there is a massive explosion of Crimean Tatar cultural production, uh, signs across the peninsula are in Arabic script. Uh, Solzhenitsyn actually writes in the Gulag, Gulag Archipelago, somewhat regret, you know, regretting that this is the case, but he acknowledges that this was a very Tatar Crimea even then. So. Um, by 1944, they, they had become a minority on the peninsula, probably about 30, 35% of the peninsula. Um, any more questions? Yes, um, yes, young man, front row. Is there a tradition in Crimean Tatar culture of full statehood for, for Crimea? Because it's recognized now as being part of the Ukrainian territory and there are clear ideas of nationhood and that kind of community, but actual statehood in a modern sense, independent of Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, any other countries that, that you know, follows through. Right, right now, Leo? At, at all over, over history. Well, for, from the 14th century to the 18th, they have tradition of statehood with the Crimean Tatar Khanate. So that, that actually becomes a very powerful example to them in the 19 teens. So in 1917, in fact, the Crimean Tatar movement goes to Kyiv because at that point, uh, the Central Rada had declared autonomy for, um, for what was eventually to be called the Ukrainian People's Republic. So they're very interested in, in sharing notes with people like Mikhail Hrushevsky, who they called kind of playful-eyed. Um, they reached out to uh, Simon Patlura, who is really earnest in actually promoting Crimean Tatar political agendas. And interesting, interestingly, Volodymyr Vinichenko um, was left out in his own world. So he was a writer as well, 
Um, when he met with the Crimean Tatar activists, he looked like he was just thinking of something else, apparently, according to the, uh, the, the memoirs of these Crimean Tatar activists. But the point is that at that time, there was a lot of discussion. If you look at the, the news, newspaper Golos Tatar, the voice of the Tatar, that was for Crimean Tatars but written in Russian, they start referring to this um, attachment of Crimea to Ukraine, to this new... Ukrainian People's Republic, which as we know in 1918 indeed was recognized as an independent sovereign state by the international community, a point that's often forgotten. So there was an interesting moment in which the Crimean Tatar community, in seeking to build a very progressive polity on Crimea, one that could guarantee the rights of all ethnicities and guarantee the right to housing, the right to vote for women, I mean all these progressive ideals that we find even under threat today, they were promoting, but they were also promoting the idea that they could be attached to a political Ukraine, too, in some way or another. Now, that doesn't happen because of the defeat to the Bolsheviks, but um, you can glimpse this, this other potential future in which something akin to what we might see in coming years uh, would have been realized. Um, this is a person here. I'm Crimean Tatar myself. Thank you for your work. Uh, my question is, it would be a statement first and then a question. Uh, after eight years of occupation, it's obvious that like, as time goes past right now, that people living there in the quite different context as that would do. So what will it take after the occupation to get those people back on track with the same context uh, that we live in the modern world, in the modern society, integrated into Ukrainian realities. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Savolunas. I think the question will come down to how quickly the Ukrainian state can provide services and guarantee freedoms for various elements of Crimean society today. Um, I think you're right to be very worried about, frankly, the brainwashing that Russian disinformation has perpetrated against a number of populations, including the one in Crimea. This is a huge problem. The one issue, I suppose, that gives me some degree of comfort is that it happened very quickly, this radicalization, this cognitive disinformation impact occurred very, very quickly. If one recalls um, and I, I cite in the book, is at least a third of the book is about the period after 1991, and then there's a chapter about events after 2014. Um, James and I were talking beforehand about a massive study of about 1,200 respondents in Crimea that showed that a large majority of people were happy in, uh, in Ukraine, considered themselves Ukrainian, Ukrainian patriots. And there's another study by our colleague Eleanor Knott at LSE, which drills down even deeper and there she finds that even in talking to so-called pro-Russian activists, this notion of really seceding from Ukraine and going to Russia was a very strange idea and a foreign idea. That in fact those who were more pro-Russian actually were more happy um, elbowing for their own interests with Kyiv rather than Moscow. They were worried about Russian interests coming in and dominating um, Crimea. So there wasn't an interest for this, but we could see within months though the public temperature and the public consciousness begin to shift. It was fairly fast. And it's amazing what fear will do. We all, we all can see this. We saw it with the pandemic. We see it in so many other narratives and headlines today. The moment you spark fear, you have people's attention, and you can radicalize them in various ways, particularly through television. So I like to think that there is a remedy for that. Um, that happens in the informational space. And I think we have colleagues in Kiev and, and, and beyond who are ready for this challenge, but I do think it needs to be concomitant with services provided um, for the population in these occupied areas where they're um, they reassured that Kyiv has their interests at heart. And I think the gray zone of a Crimea, like so many other parts of occupied Ukraine, this very violent, indeed horrific uh, landscape is one many people will acknowledge even those who are passive, on the fence, not acting and not speaking out, I think a lot of them realize just the dangerous chill that's taken over uh, Crimea. And I, I like to think that if that chill were addressed in some way by a state that is truly seeking to represent their interests, that we'll have um, 
a future in which people are working more, not to romanticize this and not to idealize it, but I do think we may see people engaging more constructively in their political future than, than we have for at least the past eight years. Yeah, um, I just want to um, add something and, and I mean ask you as well since you probably know more than I do. Um, I mean I know it's an issue um, you know, the complete opposite of the sort of emotional spectrum from um, literary um, and it, uh, concerns, um, materialist concerns. It, it is this thing that you hear recently when I was in, in Mikolaya, for example, um, people were talking about, some people were talking about how in Crimea the pensions are much higher, the pay is much higher. Um, some people were saying, actually, that's not true um, if you take everything into account. Another person who seemed to know what he was talking about was suggesting that in addition to all their repressive measures, the Russians have actually paid people more in Crimea than they do in other parts of Russia just to, to make them uh, feel that this is the place they want to be. And of course that, that message does get through, through some channels to, uh, to people in Ukraine. But perhaps you know more about this than, than we do. So talking about that, I'm not quite sure as I'm not living there for the last eight years since uh, the occupation started, but from what I know, uh, as pensions and salaries raised there, the level of um, living, the, like, the expenses are on the same level as in Moscow, so it does make sense to like raise salaries and pensions and like Overall, people are not saving at all. They were like happy for the first months after they got those pensions, but after realizing that they cannot like afford much to those pensions and the quality of products are not the same as they used to get with Ukraine, um, it would wasn't like something that they were striving after all. Hmm. Just to add to that, uh, in 2015. In 2013, there were 70,000 small businesses in Crimea, and in 2015, there were 30,000. So a massive decrease. Now, there was an increase, a moderate increase after 2015, but if one takes into account um, that loss in small business in Crimea, and then, as you said, the fact that Crimea has now been pulled out of so many different markets, um, you can't travel there easily, um, diplomas from Crimean universities don't get people into jobs and into places where they can thrive and see their families grow. So I think the cost is pretty pretty grave when we think of it from that perspective. Um, the pensions are definitely an issue that uh, the Kremlin has advertised for a long time, but I think there are lots of costs that outweigh them, really. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Yes, one last question um, from, oh. <laughs> um, let, let's do this side of the room, yes. Sure. First of all, I'd be just be interested to know um, the size of the population movement since 2014. You know, how, much, how many Russians have moved into Crimea and how many people have left and which ethnic groups? Mm. Second, Western sanctions on Crimea since 2014. How have they been counterproductive at all? You know, is the West blamed for the higher cost of goods, for example, now? Anna, thanks for the question. Um, questions. I can say that the West gets waves for everything in, in Crimea. <laughs> so, absolutely, when it comes to any kind of increase in costs, the West is to blame, Ukraine is to blame. Someone is always to blame in the Russian political worldview, as you know, and it has been that way for a very long time, sadly. As far as the numbers, I could give you some right now, I'll probably get them wrong, to be honest. Um, these are very hard to chart and track. So we were trying to do this very concertedly after 2014. Um, it was thought that at least 9,000 Crimean Tatars had left almost in the immediate aftermath of the annexation operation. So many of them going to mainland Ukraine. Um, I don't know how reliable that 9,000 number was. That was a number that was often used by Rafat Chubarov, who was head of the Crimean Tatar Majlis. Um, in total, it's thought that 20,000 or so left in 2014-15, including many ethnic Ukrainians. But again, it's hard to verify those numbers. And then as far as those coming from Russia, um, that's a big, big question. And I don't have an easy answer for that. It's hard to quantify. 
but we do know that um, there have been many that have come in in, in eerie echoes actually of 2000, or 1944 when so many Crimean Tatar homes that had been emptied out of their original owners were distributed to um, Soviet citizens. Um, a very painful, uh, a very painful practice that I think, going back to your point, James, um, all of us have some complicity, or Ukrainians and Russians in particular have to face this, um, that this did indeed happened, and, and that um, Ukrainians were a part of that dispossession. And again, I think in contemporary culture, that's exactly the kind of idea and theme that people are revisiting. Um, the wound of this war that began in 2014 is causing a lot of. Um, journeys and pursuits into common understanding between Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars that is at the same time confronting the mutual antagonism of the, in the past. It's not um, idealizing it, it, pushing it to the side. Thank you very much indeed, Rory. Um, well, I hope that uh, in a reasonably short time, we'll be reconvening here to talk about the Crimean-Ukrainian Truth and Justice Commission, and we will be drinking Crimean wine to, uh, to celebrate that. Um, but until then, um, thank you very much for this wonderful book. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you to the audience. Um, and I'd like to give Rory a, a big hand. Sadly, we don't have the books uh, for sale as such, but we have these wonderful flyers which will allow you to get 30% discounts. So please take, take it away or take a photo of it and make sure to buy those books. And I have a couple of announcements just before I thank our speakers. First, today is International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, and I'd like to uh, invite you all to come to our discussion that we will be holding tomorrow in partnership with several organizations at Birkbeck, University of London, on sexual violence as a weapon of war. In Russia, uh, as a weapon of war in Russia's war against Ukraine. That's tomorrow um, at Bartbeck. Please look up on our website. It'd be great to see you all there. Registration is free, but please do register. Um, yeah, so um, the, the flyers, don't forget. And please do stay for the reception to celebrate Rory's book. Um, and once again, thank you so much, uh, your Vietnam, you, please, and office yeah. for hosting us tonight. And thank, thank you, James Meek and Rory Bennett. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs>